we're talking today about Willie Nelson. And when I talked to Craig about it, he specifically wanted to talk about one album in particular. The album is is Stardust. Yes. I can't believe that you that you produce Starbucks. Starbucks. <laughs> 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 Sorry, the album is Stardust. I have Stardust. a lot of secrets. Some of them are in the retail sector, and some of them are in the music sector. You've let another cat out of the bag. I'm a CEO of Starbucks. Really? You're responsible for Starbucks and not Howard Schultz? <laughs> it's a different show <laughs> that I do that. Okay. That I explain <laughs> that I've secretly been... I opened every cafe ever? <laughs> I've opened... It's not as good a title, for sure. <laughs> it really isn't. It, it doesn't roll we'll off the tongue. down. But no, that that is a big deal that you're also responsible for Starbucks. But I wanted to talk about the album Stardust yes. by Willie Nelson. And I'm fascinated by this because I want to know why you chose this album over any album that you could choose. Because there are infinite possibilities. I mean, Stardust, 1978. So this would have been 45 years ago. So if like if Willie's 90 now, this was halfway through his current life. So it, that that feels it's like it's not to imply that he's going to die any minute now, but uh, like so it's it's not even the midway point of his life. But I just love this album. It's one of my favorite favorite albums of all time. I remember being a kid, and my dad would play it on cassette. I think in a really cassette uh, shitty car cassette player. It wasn't an eight track. I think it was a you know. Your classic cassette, but I just associate it with being driven to school, <gasps> oh, listening to gosh. Willie Nelson's Stardust. That's amazing. Also, uh, my freshman year of college, I was playing Trivial Pursuit with all the guys in my dorm, and I was in the center. And then the final question was, who wrote the song Stardust? And I knew immediately it was Hoagie Carmichael. I mean, as any cool 18 year old would know. <laughs> the word- the work of Ho- Hoagie Carmichael, and everybody accused me of uh, of cheating at Trivial Pursuit and having read the cards of like there was no way that I could have possibly known uh, Hoagie Carmichael. But I think due to this album, I got I grew up with a steady diet of the American Songbook, and it was uh, a very risky move on Willie's part uh, because this is kind of the height of his outlaw country fame like he was coming off of redheaded stranger which is another favorite album of mine and everybody at his record company told him not to record these standards and it became i think his best-selling album uh of all time you're listening to part one of a conversation between craig kakowski an honorary highwayman and tamara federici producer of every band ever already in progress Yeah, and I can confirm that they didn't, they really didn't want him to do that album. They didn't like that he wasn't going to put his face on the album was a problem. They were like, this is a recipe for disaster. They thought it wasn't going to hook anyone, especially young people. And he was not interested in really playing to young people. He said, great, this will be for older people or people my age. And the young people will think that I wrote this. So they'll just think it's new music. So he didn't feel like he was alienating anybody. He just really, I think, really wanted to interpret this because he... You know, he grew up with this. And I mean, I think there's more to it than that. But that's the story I know. So were you part of the conversation of what songs to record or with these Willie's ideas? These are we 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 pared down. I think we we pared down together. Really, it was all his choice because he was so driven about, you know, what kind of moved him. The thing that he kept gravitating towards was longevity and love stories that are big love stories not like the outlaw stuff at all tiny love stories yeah i think i think that was what it was they're all so earnest so i just kind of let him have his hand at that because he seemed to have something in mind about just being very straightforward about what, like i don't know it just feels like these feel like big themes so i just kind of left alone at that but there must have been songs like standards that didn't make the cut, like things that you'd tried out that uh, that were left off the album. Did you remember any of those? Yeah, Mr. Bojangles, that was not going to be right for him at all. Really? Okay. Yeah. I don't really think of that as an American standard, uh, I guess, but... Uh... <laughs> I think I feel... <laughs> sometimes I think things are standard that aren't standard at all. Um, sure. Fly Me to the Moon, 
I think okay. I could have done a good version of that, um, but that didn't that didn't materialize. It feels like that would tie in with the space themed cover. Yeah, you know? right. Fly me to the moon, and then there's a giant moon. And you could maybe hide like a, a tiny image of Willie's face in the moon. He tried to put a jazz spin on things, and then that got to be too much because this is so harmonica forward. I've noticed it's a very harmonica forward album. Yeah. There are a lot of harmonicas used in this that I don't think people know about because they just think about harmonicas and hobos. Those kind of go together. That's the association I have. (laughs) I mean, I imagine it's a session musician playing harmonica, but in my mind, I'm always imagining a hobo with a bindle. Yes. And kind of three-day stubble pulling out a harmonica. Though it, it, it that can't possibly be that a hobo was just wandering around the studio and then surreptitiously started playing <laughs> harmonica on the track. But that is, that's the image that this album conjures, which I think is a positive image. That is true. Perhaps in the really, really early days, that is what happened. But this was actually, so there were studio musicians and then you actually had, much like flutes, you had your size of harmonica. And so we think of the one that is, you know, very small and kind of sandwich sized, right? Compact. Compact. You can play it. It's got the hobo uh, imagery. It's the, uh, it's the tool of the under, it's the musical tool of the underdog. But this Mm -hmm. is, you know, these were guys that were, they were dressed up, like they were ready to go. So I think. Okay. So each one specialized in a different harmonica. Right. They sound like they're all the same, but you can kind of hear it whining on some and some, it sounds a little lower. That's an alto harmonica. And then there's a, mm. the largest one actually like bends right around again. So it's actually that. It's actually sort of a J shape. It's pretty low. And sometimes it acts as a bass, you know, a bass line, a bass guitar. And so that actually takes two to three people to hold up and then two people to play that. And they actually have to run a little bit. There's one who does the curb. There's one who does this one. And then they can actually do two different parts, two different stems of the whole thing. It's kind of, have you ever seen The Thousand Fingers of Dr. T? I have not, but I know what it is. It's a Dr. Seuss movie, right? Yes. And there's a giant, there's giant, giant pianos and some of them are curved. It looks a little bit like that. Mm. Uh, no keys, of course. And it sounds just, the, the sound is fuller. But yeah, I feel like the harmonica is the... Un- so you're saying there's multiple mouths on the same harmonica. Yes, it wasn't a problem at a that J-shaped time. J-shaped harmonica with two heads. Mm-hmm. Two to three people holding. So sometimes you can have one in the middle and on either side, or sometimes you just remove that. It depends on what you can afford. I would imagine that would get dangerous of like, you might bonk heads with another harmonica player if you're going for the same note. I think they worked it out. This is why they're the professionals. I think they've had time to... to... I know that there was one high school jazz band that had this. So I would expect that those kids are coming out of that. You know, like those kids become these professionals. You know, this was recorded in the Hollywood Hills. So these are kind of L.A., you know, L.A. musicians. I think they kind of just get trained into it. I'm not sure if it's a family business or what, but they know how to handle those situations of like um, fast runs. That's interesting to think about because I associate Willie with Nashville for, for the country, you know, industry. But I also associate him with Texas. But it was weird to think about him living in Los Angeles and recording in the Hollywood Hills. I agree. So what like what 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 brought him to L.A. at this point in his life? I think mostly weed. I think that was it. (laughs) That was it. And we wouldn't see him. I mean, the whole his whole ethos was uh, relax, man. Like, that's it. That was his catchphrase. That was sort of the credo that we live by. It wasn't dance like no one's looking. It was just relax, man. So I think that's how he ended up in L.A. That's a very L.A. motto. What percentage of time that you have been around Willie is he fully baked? 92%. 92? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's still going strong. <laughs> what's he like the 8% of time that he's not stoned? Mean. Like what's what sort of things does he say? I'll feed you to my dog. Oh, really? Yeah. And he looks at- That doesn't sound like the Willie that I know at all. I know. That's why it's better with the 92%. (laughs) I think this album really like cemented Willie's reputation as just an interpreter because he is like a great songwriter, but he also can cover any material and make it his own. To the point where I've heard it said that Willie could sing the phone book and make it interesting- have you actually heard Willie singing the phone book? I tried to get him to record A through H, and that took a while. 
but it was pr- A through H of Los Angeles? Yes. He was really good. Honestly, J made me cry and B made me laugh. And I'm not sure how that is, but I think that's just a testament as he, he really felt it on B and J. Okay, but J is not included in A through H, by the way. <laughs> Don't tell Willie that. It's you had you had you had him jump ahead to Jay. Well, sometimes the studio is really really wafty with smoke, so sometimes you know you just lose a little bit. We did a covers album this year, and I don't remember anything about it. <laughs> it's a country album, and I was secondhand high the whole time, so I think it I think it went okay. I feel like it went fine. He, he knows he knows what he's doing. So it would sound a little bit like Jackson Bell, seven seven three five two eight six two eight zero. I didn't even think of adding the numbers. You're really great at this. It was just the names. Wait, you had him sing the phone book and omit the phone numbers? It was really about the names, the people, instead of the, the names, uh, yeah. numbers. He's not really a numbers guy. He's more of a you know a names guy. What is your fit? Do you have a favorite track on this album? Man, I love them all. I really love Blue Skies. What's your favorite thing about it? I think this again, because this was an album for me as a kid, but I also was a big Muppets fan. And there was a Muppet show sketch of Prairie Dogs singing Blue Skies. I'm dying. Do you remember this <laughs> at all? This <sighs> oh, Prairie Dogs and each of them pop out for like a little snippet of the song. And then they'll pop out at the same time for Harmony. And I think as a kid, I conflated those because that was the only association I had with that song because I know the Willie Nelson version. I know the Prairie Dog version, which came first because they would have been around the same time. Like 78 was like right the heyday of of Muppet Show. Was Willie influenced by the Muppets or vice versa? That is an age old question. I feel like you're hitting upon. That's like a chicken and egg situation. He loved the Muppets so much. I mean... There's so much you can, gon, I feel a little bit of Gonzo in this album, a little bit of the wistfulness that Gonzo possesses, I feel like is in this album. Sure. I mean, like the the mood of I hope I go back there someday from the, the Muppet movie of like, that feels like the same genre as every track on Stardust. And I think there's a little harmonica on that song too. Yeah. And especially, I was actually thinking about Kermit when uh, a lot of these love songs have the same feel as Kermit. At the beginning of um, why are there so many songs about rainbows, right? That song is actually as earnest and as like facing as all of these songs are. Like one of the unnerving things about these songs are that he sounds vulnerable and that he's saying the plain truth in a lot of them. And that's Kermit to a T. He's earnest. He's sitting on that lily pad and we come in on that banjo. That's so Willie Nelson. You know, you can see them hanging out easily on a lily pad or in the Hollywood Hills. And they have a similar timbre to their voice, I would say. Also. Yes, and they're both not hurried. The whole tempo of this album is Kermit-style, Muppet movie, original. Can't speak to the other ones. This album takes its time. Like This is my ultimate like zone out and chill, mellow album when I want to just relax. Because like, September Song like has got to be one of the slowest moving tracks you will ever hear and i think it get it slows down as it goes also what was behind that decision to make that track so slow i feel like we somehow knew that we needed to be a bridge to phoebe bridgers we needed to make this pre-skeleton and it needed to it was going to influence people in the future it was hard to slow it down i needed an actual metronome because it just it feels a little too slow in that way that stanley kubrick's 2001 how he slowed that down and it feels too slow this is like that <laughs> that song is like that to me where you're like speed up speed up and then you're like oh no i have time to think in these in between these moments but it matches the lyrics you know the the days uh slow down you know to a precious few like it's it's kind of like being in the at the end of your life like looking back and and appreciating the the days and not wanting it to end so i I think that was a brilliant choice thank you and also in 1978 to anticipate the existence of phoebe bridgers was just incredible forethought it just worked out we had a feeling and then we were like let's act on that feeling You know, as you were talking, I also realized that the song that would have been perfect for him to do is uh, Feeling Groovy. 
It is amazing. Slow down, you're moving too fast. And groovy. Like, all of those things. I mean, even though he's he was outlaw country, he'd be pretty comfortable in that. It's kind of amazing we didn't do that. It's the right slowness of that, too. He's the epitome of groovy. Yeah. I think maybe we should go back and record this as a single Taylor Swift style and put it on the end of the album and then release it at, like, 425 a.m. and see how it does. One thing I, I know about Willie is that he has a famous guitar, Trigger. To the point where Trigger has its own Wikipedia entry. There's also been documentaries made about Trigger. And I know he's had the same guitar since 1969 and that he says he'll retire when Trigger, when he can no longer play Trigger. And Trigger has like a huge hole in it uh, as well that because he's worn it down from where he's been picking over the years. Do you have any good Trigger stories from this session? Between you and I, Trigger has been playing in other bands really yeah does willie know that no i am not going to be the one to it's sort of like how do you tell somebody that their guitar is cheating on them you don't you know maybe that's his Mm. to find out maybe one of the other instruments will clue him in i don't know if the other instruments have not seemed to work that way but i'm gonna keep a professional distance on that and that's been really uh stressful i feel like for the harmonic hands and for everyone it's been a little unnerving honestly amazing what can I say? I love me some cowboy content. Guest Craig Kakowski is an actor and improviser based in Los Angeles. People usually recognize him from Drunk History, Community, Veep, or dozens of projects he was not in. You can also hear him on season one asking about Tom Waits and Liz Fair. Tamara Federici workshopped the word tenderoni for a year before bringing it to Michael Jackson. Every band ever is. Will Velasquez as editor and producer Clark Jackson as audio engineer Will Briley for publicity Mary Lear as coordinator Jonah Katz for special projects artwork by Simon Morris Winheld for more info, visit our link tree at Every Band Ever on Instagram. Get along little doggies. This episode was recorded on June 1st, 2023.